Hi guys. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming out. Um, I do have a question. Would you prefer me to have my mask on or no? Right? Alright, because I'm kind of far away, but I like to ask. So starting to get back into the swing of things, right? COVID's been rough. But anyways, thank you again to the library for having me. This is actually my fourth presentation that I've, I've done here, and my team, the San Diego Paranormal Research Society, has been privileged to conduct actual paranormal investigations here at the library twice. So it's really been a great experience. So, uh, so like she said, I'm a paranormal researcher, uh, founder and director of the San Diego Paranormal Research Society. Uh, that was founded in 2009. So we primarily specialize in ghosts and hauntings and, and haunted locations. We've conducted investigations at private homes, businesses, many historical locations uh, within San Diego uh, and um, out of state and even up in LA. So uh, I'm very passionate about paranormal research. And so of course, I'm also a writer uh, I've written a few books, uh, and then I also write for Paranormal Underground. It's a really good magazine for all things paranormal. Paranormalunderground.net is the website for that. And then I've written some books here, three on the Queen Mary, uh, Spirits of Rancho Buena Vista Adobe, On the Queen of the Seas, a Queen Mary book, San Diego's Most Haunted, another Queen Mary book, and then this Field Guide is, was my very first book like 12 years ago, so I've come a long way. So my forthcoming book, The Afterlife Chronicles, Exploring the Connection Between Life, Death, and Beyond, uh, is coming out, it should be coming out this fall with Shipper. I don't know if they're going to be uh, backlogged because of COVID. So I decided to develop a presentation from the book, and then of course my radio show, uh, The Afterlife Chronicles, on Thursday nights uh, at WLTKDB.com. This is the website right here. Um, there's many different shows on that site. So it's an internet uh, radio station. And so my show focuses on the paranormal, but with a specific theme of the strong connection between mortality or the living world and the afterlife. And again, that's on Thursday nights at 6 Pacific, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. And then, of course, I host Common Voices Radio with uh, Todd Bates as well, same station, Tuesday night, same times, WLTKDB.com. And then uh, my dear friend and team co-director, Ali Schreiber, uh, her and I are the hosts of the Spirits of the Adobe Tours at the Rancho Buena Vista Adobe. Sadly, they are on hiatus because of COVID right now. So I just spoke with the City of Vista. They think that the tours will start to resume in 2022. So they take place the third Friday of each month at 7 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. So the tours are a blend of the site's history and the site's uh, paranormal phenomena. And so uh, myself and the team, we've been conducting investigations there since 2011. So it is an ongoing case study. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful location. How many of you have been to the Adobe? Anyone? Okay, so a few. Beautiful location. Uh, they have uh, educational programs there. They have uh, many people choose to get married there, and for good reason. So it's a really, really great location, and we're very honored to be doing the work that we do there. And our tours are fundraisers, so proceeds go to the Adobe. So a little bit about uh, so what got me into the paranormal. I've always been interested ever since I was a young girl. I've always had experiences that I couldn't explain. I haven't classically uh, defined myself as a psychic medium. Uh, I think everyone has the ability to be intuitive and have psychic senses. Uh, but being involved in a field, my senses have grown and they've uh, uh, expanded. So this is my grandmother, maternal grandmother, Helen Lopinto, and that's me when I was a little tight. And, uh, I want to share a story. Now, a lot of the stories that I'm going to share today are in the forthcoming book, The Afterlife Chronicles. I'm going to condense them, though, because of time. So, in my college, I went to the University of Arizona, and I graduated in 2001. And so, when I was a senior, my grandmother called me the day before she died, and she wanted to know if I was okay. And I thought, well, this is odd. Why is she calling me like this? So I talked with her for about 10 minutes and then got off the phone and then the next day my mom over there, sitting over there, Norma, that's her daughter, 
um, obviously. She uh, said, I'm so sorry. I knew by the tone of her voice, she said, I'm so sorry, sweetheart, your grandma passed away early in the morning at about 4.45 a.m. So I was devastated. I booked the first flight out to San Diego because I went to college at the U of A in Tucson. We had a small little service for her. And then when I went back to Tucson, I started having odd experiences in my apartment that were not going on that I had never experienced prior. The doorknobs at the front door and my bedroom door would like rattle of their own volition. And what's interesting is when my grandmother was alive, she would always go around to the doors at night and, and make sure they were locked. I didn't really connect the dots yet. A couple of days later, I was sitting on my bed doing studies, and all of a sudden, I, I didn't see anything, but I felt a hand caress my face. That's when I connected the dots, and I said, oh my goodness, could this be my grandmother communicating with me from beyond? And so, again, a couple more days elapsed, and then all of a sudden, I was again at night in my bedroom, on my bed again, doing my studies, and all of a sudden, I saw something out of my left peripheral vision. And when I looked, I saw my grandmother. She looked about 10, she died when she was about 95 years old, so she looked about 10 or 15 years younger. It looked as though she had a spotlight behind her shining against her, so she had this real bright halo around her. She was wearing one of her favorite uh, blue and white house dresses that she always liked to wear. She didn't say anything to me. She had a side slight smile on her face. And then she just demanifested, just disappeared right before my eyes. And the experience lasted for quite a while. And so even though I have had an interest in the paranormal for so many years, that experience really catapulted me out into active investigation of the paranormal. So since that time, I've been working with other teams and really uh, learning about the paranormal and the afterlife. So I really credit her for this journey, I really do. So a little bit about this presentation, I've already mentioned that it's an extension from my upcoming book, The Afterlife Chronicles, exploring the connection between life, death, and beyond, and my radio show. But I do want to let you know that this presentation, which is the first time I've actually ever done it, so you know, bear with me here, but uh, the purpose is not to persuade you or anyone else to have beliefs in the afterlife. That's not my job. All I can do is share with you my experiences in, in hopes that it opens up your eyes and heart to what exists beyond for us. Uh, it emphasizes the bonds of love that we have with our loved ones, our friends, our co-workers, our animals that transition to the other side. And they remain with us eternally. And as a paranormal researcher, I've evolved from just getting really excited about what evidence I'm going to get, if I'm gonna capture a cool picture, what experiences I'm gonna have, and don't, I still look forward to that, don't get me wrong. But I'm left now with, what now? You know, what can I do maybe to build this rapport with the energies that I'm working with? What can I do for them? Do they need help? Are they trying to give me a message or someone else? So I'm kind of looking behind the curtain and beyond just the, the who, what, when, where, and now looking at the how, the how and the why, if that makes sense. And so it focuses on the intrinsic yet cosmic motivation between, between the living and the afterlife's desire to connect with each other. And so a lot of the topics that I'm going to mention today, and there are a lot, these correlate to afterlife study and research, and there's a lot of it, okay? So someone can say, well, what is the afterlife? Now, if I, said, if I stood up here and said, well, I absolutely know exactly what the afterlife is, I would kind of would be a fraud, but I'm going based on what many people have experienced through near-death encounters and that, which we'll get to later. So when you think of the when you think of the paranormal, you have different branches. Okay, you have study of UFOs, you have the study of cryptozoology, you have uh, the study of other types of beings like uh, uh, fairies, fey people, the uh, elementals, and then you have ghost spirits and hauntings. Right. So the afterlife for us humans, when we pass, there that's where we go. And, and a lot of research and a lot of, and this goes back many years, even to medieval times, it is said that our, our soul, the essence of our, our being, 
survives death and moves on into the afterlife, and it's a process of soul maturity. So when you think about this life here, we've come from past lives to this life, and then we evolve into the afterlife. So if you reverse afterlife, you get life after, right? And so it contains uh, higher evolved spiritual beings. Now there's a difference between a ghost and a spirit. A ghost or an earthbound energy is, is someone who has passed, but for whatever reason, it is still tied to this realm. A spirit is someone who also has passed, but has come to terms with their passing, his or her passing, and has moved on into the ranks of spirithood, if that makes sense, okay? So, an individual, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, he was a Swedish scientist and statesman. He was born in 1688. He really studied the afterlife. So he thrived during the Enlightenment period, and that this came before spiritualism. And this is a time where people preferred logic and reason as opposed to religious teachings. So he wanted to understand the, the intricacies of the afterlife by exploring the physical world. So he claimed from his stories that his sixth sense was open and he, and he interacted with ethereal energies via nightly telepathic dreams of angels and saints ascending up staircases. He claimed that he was permitted to endure the dying process and be awakened in spirit and uh, allowing him to understand what happens to the soul after death, okay? Death of the physical body, but not the soul. And so he claimed, and his claim matches that of numerous near-death encounters that have been researched. There are numerous studies on near-death experiences. I'll cite a couple later on. But he claimed that uh, the afterlife is similar to the physical world, but more vivid, more of a brightly colored earthly landscape, a more alive uh, colors that we, we know our colors here are in the physical world, but even more vivid colors in the afterlife. So uh, he's, and there's a lot of, he's actually, I forget the book he wrote, so I forget the title of it, but he actually wrote a book and he goes more um, in depth uh, about his experiences. So, okay, so let's examine this profound connectedness between the living and afterlife, okay? So let me, I have some notes here so I don't forget. Now, a lot of this is my opinion and the opinions of others that have researched in the paranormal and even those that have done studies in the afterlife. We know that love, the love that we have for ourselves and for others is eternal, right? So the, the connections that we have with our loved ones, that remains, that never goes anywhere. Love is eternal. So those that are physically gone, but physically gone and no longer with us physically, that love continues. The memories we have with our loved ones, that continues and goes on. But it's how that happens that remains a mystery. So, you know, I'm thinking like, is the interest of the, the study of afterlife, is it getting bigger because of society's focus? Meaning that the paranormal, paranormal research is such a hot topic subject these days, and more and more people are open to experiencing uh, or having encounters with spirit, more people are open to sharing with others the encounters that they have. So is that fueling this connection? Or is there something greater? Maybe it's a combination of a bunch of different things. I believe somewhere way out in the cosmos that there's this sort of cosmic shift that is causing the living and the afterlife to connect more and more with each other. And, uh, you know, it could be due to a lot of different reasons. I mean, when we think about it, we have a pandemic going on. Uh, people are hurting each other now these days. There's a lot of turmoil, a lot of challenge. So it seems that perhaps the afterlife and those, our loved ones that are now evolved, are maybe trying to give us messages, maybe trying to uh, help us a little bit, and then us helping them in return. So it's this duality, so to speak. So there's this parallel relationship between our world and the next. Um, and I believe, a lot of people believe that when we pass, our souls, the essence of each one of us, grows and evolves and matures to a greater understanding of the universe. Uh, 
are having a knowledge of the secrets to the universe, whether it's through Akashic records or soul maturity. So, you know, does the spirit realm have some of the answers to our problems? I don't know. Maybe. So we're all connected, right? Each one of us, we're all connected and we're all connected to something greater beyond us. Now imagine if each one of us tapped into that, how it would be, right? And uh, more people now more than ever are starting to really get in tune with their higher selves. They want to uh, have spiritual awakenings and be more evolved uh, spiritually. And so I found this quote, and it's actually from the book, The Afterlife Experiments. And it, what they say here kind of matches my opinions as well. So I'll read it. If the living soul hypothesis is true, and we develop our abilities to hear what the dead have to say to us, perhaps human deceit might come to an end. It's possible that we could enter a new era of human caring that Linda and I, obviously the authors, call integrity love. We would be strongly encouraged to put it mildly, to take responsibility for our actions, transforming the way we live our daily lives. And as more of us openly look to the deceased for everyday guidance, this potential could make life easier, safer, and more rewarding. So that's quite profound. So doing my research for the book, I, I really uh, researched uh, those that are delving into the study of afterlife, and I found some interesting aspects here. One of which is the cosmic reservoir hypothesis. And so this was coined by Professor William James. So he says that all things that occurred since the beginning of time are deposited in the cosmos whereby a channeler can access that information. So this theory also supports why the energetic essence of each one of us, our individual makeup, and memories never goes away. They remain, okay? You can even, if you wanna think about it critically, you can even apply Einstein's uh, law of conservation of energy, I believe it is. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Our soul remains and gets stronger as it does goes through its, uh, the stages of maturity. So the human soul has uh, omnipresent energy, so to speak. You can really think critically about that. Uh, so I mentioned earlier the living soul hypothesis. So we've all heard the phrase or the, the words collective consciousness. So our soul houses the essence of each one of us. Our memories, our psyche, our intuition. It is what connects individual intelligence to collective intelligence, meaning collective meaning intelligence of uh, the world of, of um, the afterlife, so to speak. So it's separate from the physical body's organ system. You can leave the body at any time. So when someone passes, of course, you have the physical shell and the physical body, but that soul, that's the energy, that is the essence of each one of us, that leaves and, and lives on, okay? So Emile Durkheim uh, is a founding pioneer in the concept of collective consciousness. And so this shared consciousness allows us to share behaviors, beliefs, perspectives, and values, okay? So here's some more interesting things here. So quantum physics is applied a lot in the paranormal. So does the soul continue on a quantum level? So quantum physics claims that our lives here or that there's a parallel universe of our lives regardless of what we're doing here. So it conveys that life is not comprised of matter, but of vibrations that break away with time and space. Okay, so it's, it's way out there, I know. So I found three aspects here. So Munich's Max Planck Institute for Physics has done a lot of studies on the afterlife, and it claims that our uh, that the physical universe that we reside in is only really our perception and an infinite beyond exists once our bodies stop functioning, okay? So many experts claim now that there really is no death of the human consciousness, only death of the physical body, okay? And then, oops, hello. And then we go uh, to uh, the second one here, 
orchestrated objective reduction, or or R, or OR, excuse me now. So a researcher by the name of Stuart Hammeroff of the University of Arizona, which is where I went, so this is kind of cool, along with British physicist Sir Roger Penrose. So they feel that our consciousness is merely informa information that's deposited on a quantum level. So they talk about how there are these these microtubules, which are the structural structural constituent of our cells, and that um, that information within them holds uh, quantum information that is housed at a subatomic level. So the material within these structural constituent of our cells cannot be destroyed once someone is beyond the threshold of death. And so they say, this is very, this is a quote from them. If they're not revived and the patient dies, it's possible that this quantum information can exist outside of the body, perhaps indefinitely as a soul. Moving on, uh, and there's, I mean, these are, I'm just going through this really quickly, but there's a lot to read about these. So, uh, renowned scientist Robert Lanza, um, he talks about biocentrism, and I think this is really cool. So he thinks that uh, death is, physical death is an aspect that our consciousness builds up, that our consciousness makes up. And so he claims that really there is no death because there's really no way to marginally dis describe it. And so he talks about the duality of, of like biology and um, our life and that uh, pretty much life is immortal basically on what he says. And so uh, I'm gonna quote him here. He says, when our bodies physically die, our lives then become a perennial flower that returns to bloom in the multiverse. When we die, our energy lives on and travels to another dimension. Consciousness exists in the energy housed in our bodies and released once death occurs, okay? So very, very, very interesting concepts here. Um, so now getting into near-death experiences. Can these near-death experiences, or NDEs for short, hold the keys to understanding life after death? So it's said that the spirit world uh, afterlife or afterlife exists just above the Earth's plane. And so the vibrations that exist in the astral world and the spirit world are stronger. And so what's interesting, and I'm gonna get into some NDE traits here, uh, it, people that have had near death experiences but have come back, they say that uh, they went to a place and it looks very similar to what we have here on Earth, just with it more alive, it's more vivid, it's more colorful. And another interesting aspect is that people have claimed that have had NDEs that they can imagine the landscape and then that landscape appears. So let's say, you know, people of various cultures, when they go to the afterlife, the landscape, the geological landscape for them in their afterlife is similar to, to their culture, which is really, really cool. Um, animated colors, striking features, uh, unlike those ever witnessed here on Earth. And so NDEs have been studied for years. There are, like I said earlier, there are numerous, numerous studies out, okay? I mean, and then the statistics from them, and I'll cite some, are very interesting. So NDEs occur when someone is very close to death, whether it's from like cardiac arrest or a coma or asphyxiation or a drowning. And so when I think of NDEs, do they occur to help us illuminate the path of where we're going? Do they occur for people to, uh, uh, to give them a glimpse of what awaits us when we, when we transition, thus you know, giving, making it a little easier for us to lessen the fear of death? Is it a psychological projection on the part of the dying to help make it easier? There's all these uh, questions. Do NDEs occur to help uh, grieving families and grieving friends come to terms with death? These are all questions to think about. So, uh, let's see, I already did that. Um, so Raymond Moody, 
Ray, you cannot talk about NDEs without hearing Raymond Moody. There might be a book over there uh, referencing him or one of his uh, on the table over there. So he was a physician and founding father of studying NDEs. He published his 1975 book, Life After Life. And so after he published this book, he had people from Western and non-Western religions and cultures come to him and, and talk to him and say, my goodness, my experiences matched what, what you were talking about in the book. So he collected over 150 different NDE encounters. And so the International Association for Near-Death Studies, IANDS, was formed and developed. International Association for Near-Death Studies. So let's get into some common characteristics and traits that people from all over the world pediatrics, uh, children, adults, people of different cultures, people of different backgrounds, claim almost very similarities, and these are the primary ones. So people claim, sometimes seeing that they're going through a tunnel, at the end of the tunnel there's this bright light, they ascend or ascend upward toward a very bright light, coming in contact with a deceased family and friends or pets, uh, coming in contact with higher beings and having this all-knowing, beautiful sense of love, intelligence, wisdom, compassion, and truth. And you go back to medieval times and even modern depiction of NDEs, people report a sense of clarity, transparency, warmth, beautiful energy, waking up in a paradise with surroundings and an environment common to that person's culture, like I mentioned earlier. A lot of reports, uh, people talk about being stalked by a deceased loved one or a friend or a higher being and told, this is not your time, you need to go back. Lives, and this is where a lot of people will have lives, their lives flash before them in review. So they come to term with, come to terms with their, their life and their mistakes and everything that uh, profound that occurred uh, in their earthly life. And you hear this a lot with NDEs, people claim once they experience that, they don't want to come back to Earth. They want to stay because it's so beautiful. And so they've had a chance to go into the light and experience it and know this all-knowing sense of true love and compassion, so they lose interest in material objects and money. No longer fear of death. They get closer, a renewed appreciation for their life on Earth, a renewed appreciation for their life and family. Psychic abilities will dramatically increase with people that have NDEs, and they a lot of times will embark on a spiritual journey. Another interesting thing is too, an interesting thing too is like there have been uh, claims of wristwatches malfunctioning, but yet the watches will work on other people that aren't that have not experienced that NDE. So crazy, crazy stuff. We all know the song by Enigma, Return to Innocence, right? How many of you have watched the music video to that song? Anyone? So a few? Okay. When you get a chance, I wish we would have time today, but when you get a chance, Google or YouTube it, Return to Innocence, and watch that video music, the official music video from start to finish. It is about an older man that is about to pass in transition or has passed in transition, and his life is in review. So I'll go ahead and play a little verse here, although we all know the song. And so it's basically this lyric right here. So 
I forgot to mention earlier that there could be like 20 presentations that could, that could emanate from this one presentation I'm doing because of so much information. One of them could be a whole entire presentation on, on near-death experience studies and what contributes to near-death experiences. So uh, I, I'm gonna, we all know, I'm, well maybe not everyone knows, but the book, the best-selling book, Heaven is for Real, which is about a little boy who uh, died from a ruptured appendix. He came back and he claimed to have visited heaven, sat with Jesus, and communicated with a miscarried sister that he did not know prior. Heaven is for real. Another really well-known uh, story is a Harvard physician that, uh, oh gosh, I forget if it was an accident or what happened in his his brain, his cortex just literally stopped functioning, which this defied medical explanation. He claims to have died, and then when he came back, he said he met God, he met, you know, went into the spirit world and met God, and he was told that, uh, or not told, he experienced that, um, uh, how do I say this? Um, he, would, he claimed that he and God believe that there is this unconditional love toward all living things. So really cool. So what are NDEs due to? What, what are they, what are they uh, caused from? They're still studying this, but some things are the psychopathology, uh, transformed blood gases, sleep disturbances and brain activity near death and they're still researching all of this okay uh new york university's langone medical center the study of human consciousness and survival of death this is the largest nde study of its kind and it's led by dr sam parnia uh, the director of, uh, of resuscitation research so he says that with advances in medicine, people can be brought back to life and study intricately what happens to them after they die. So he says that the cells in the brain do not immediately die. They go through this process of decay, and in that time, it allows the medical team, even though that person has been deceased for several minutes to hours, um, to be brought back and the organs studied. Okay, so. He's studied 2,000 individuals that have had near-death encounters. Here's some of the statistics that he uh, got from his study. Up to 40% of those who came back to life had a perception of what was happening to them even though they were beyond the threshold of death, okay? 10% had a very deeply spiritual experience. 2% had full awareness, but then he says, some may have, some more may have had full awareness, but later forgot, maybe due to medications or uh, medical treatment. Another study by the University of Virginia, Emily Williams Kelly, whoops, um, she said that, or her study, she found that 41% uh, of dying patients encountered deceased loved ones, friends, or spiritual beings in the days and hours leading up to their death physical death, okay? Very interesting stuff. There's a lot, there, there are books over there on the table about near-death encounters. Numerous books written on uh, near-death experiences. I just literally covered the tip of the iceberg here. So how do energies connect with us? So I have an entire presentation devoted to spirit communication techniques that the paranormal researchers use alternative techniques like using pendulums and crystals, uh, uh, seances, automatic writing, to the more conventional techniques of uh, conducting audio experiments like uh, electronic voice phenomena, instrumental transcommunication, all of that. But that, there's so much that you need to know for that. There's a lot of protocols and there's, there's a lot of responsibility with that that I want to dedicate to an entire different presentation. So maybe we can do that one, one day here at the library. Um, so I have a story from the Wealth Resort. So the, es the Wealth Resort here at Escondido, my family has a timeshare there. It's been in our family for years. So my maternal grandmother, uh, Marion Strickland, uh, my dad's mom, of course, 
passed away in April of, oh gosh, it was 2006, I believe it was. So then our timeshare is in May, the third week of May. And so I was there at the unit one day and all of a sudden I heard my name, I heard Nicole. And I, I recognized Mary's voice, I knew it was her. And I said, Grandma, is that you? And then I heard her talking to me. I couldn't really make out what was said, but I thought I heard, I love you, blah, blah, blah. And then I smelled her perfume, very powerful perfume, which I've smelled in her house as well. And so you can get vocalizations. You can hear energies when they come, they can talk to you. You can hear them with your naked ear, but you can also hear them clear audiently as well. So you don't hear with your ear, but you can hear psychically, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see, they come through uh, in our dreams. This is huge. So the veil is thought between our world and the next to be thinnest when we're asleep. It's also thin around Halloween too, just saying. Mm -hmm. But uh, you want, so what's interesting is uh, the Society for Psychical Research, which still exists today, they wrote something called Phantasms of the Living. And so it discusses and analyzes 149 cases of telepathic dream encounters. So in, in their analysis, they found that both agent and recipient were connected as friends or family in those dreams. Louisa Rhine, which is, uh, who is the wife of Joseph Banks Rhine of the Rhine Research Center, another very well-known uh, parapsychological research center, they amassed more than 10,000 spontaneous psi, PSI, all that is a psychic phenomena, psychic phenomena events. Out of that 10,000, they found that 65% of those extrasensory perception or ESP encounters occurred within dreams, telepathic dreams when we're asleep, okay? So, uh, okay, so set your, if you wanna have these dreams, set your intention before going to sleep, that's very important. Uh, a brief story of my friend, Ali Schreiber, who I mentioned earlier. She, uh, so the night that her dad died, he hadn't yet passed. So he was, I guess, on the brink of passing. So Ali went to sleep, and she had a dream where she was in her dad's house and he was standing at the top of the stairs. So she walked up the stairs and was able to hug him. He was able to hug her and they embraced each other for what seemed like a long time. And then she woke up early in the morning. She woke up, I think her alarm went off. She turned the light switch on. She went in the kitchen and it was shortly after that her mom called and said her dad passed in the middle of the night. And I believe that she hugged him and embraced him at the moment that he died. That's my belief, knowing how it. So messages and numbers, this is another one how they communicate. Uh, spirits and angels uh, are responsible for showing us these certain number patterns that may have significance to us. The sequences of 333, 555, 444 are big ones. It could be just a random number. Um, I actually have a September 11th story in my book that has to do with 911, actually. It's a little too long to share, but I'm gonna get it, uh, share two stories. One, uh, my grandmother that I talked about earlier, Helen Lopinto, and my beloved cat, Max, who is right here. So, my, my maternal, so my mom's mom, my maternal grandmother, uh, she passed at about 4.45 a.m. in the morning. I kind of believe it was 4.44. After her death, I started seeing these, the numbers of 444, 444, 444 everywhere. And it would be, it would occur at the most random times, but I would know instinctively that it was just some sort of message. My cat, Max, I still have his sister, Kaylee, who's now 18 years old. But Max here, they're litter mates. I adopted them shortly after the 2003 wildfires here in San Diego when they were about three months old. And so Max sadly, uh, well, I actually took him to the vet in 2016. He had conjunctivitis in his eye. But incidentally, when I was there, I, uh, the, my, my veterinarian, the veterinarian, Dr. Houston said, you know, he has a heart murmur. I'm like, what? Oh my gosh, what? So we immediately uh, scheduled an ultrasound of the heart or an echocardiogram. And so they confirmed, yes, okay, this is due to cardiomyopathy. 
So they said, look, you know, there's treatment for it, there's medication, there's beta blockers for him, and it can really allow him to live a longer life. And so we started him on beta blockers, and uh, it was, did really work, but shortly after that, uh, he passed, and I'll get to his story in a little bit, but I do want to say that he passed at about 4.45 p.m. on, I believe it was February 12, 2016. So 445, 444, like this, those numbers keep popping up for me. Moving on to Dragonfly with Kevin Costner. Throughout the movie, his character keeps seeing dragonflies. So I believe it's been a while since I've seen the movie, but I believe his wife dies. And after that, he keeps seeing dragonflies, just random dragonflies everywhere. So he followed that and it led him to this other country where he found his son that he didn't know he had. And on the sons, I believe it was a lake, there was a birthmark of a dragonfly, okay? So that's some examples of that. Um, another story I have is um, my friend Adam's mom who lives out in Minnesota, she had a, a really beloved cat that passed and they have a large backyard. So they buried the cat out there. And when she got a new cat, oh gosh, I forget, it's, it's in the book, I forget. I think it was a while after her cat passed. And when she got the new cat, that cat instinctively knew with this big backyard to go lay right on the spot where she buried her cat. So just interesting ways that uh, spirits use to, to communicate with us. Um, also unexplained noises. You may hear tapping or rapping or, uh, you know, for example, I'll, I'll get to that story in a second. But when you, and this is just, I'm thinking outside of the box here, but you hear a force code, right? Well, could, could rhythmic sounds like tapping, knocking, be some sort of protocol applied by the afterlife to communicate with the living? I don't know, just something I thought I'd throw out there. So getting back to Angela Wallace, she's uh, her grandfather, her grandmother was named Pa. So interesting story here. Same house, she was staying in his house after he passed. Now, when he was alive, he, would, he had a missing tooth and he would always whistle when he'd talk. And then he had knees that would pop a lot. So when he'd walk, you'd hear the popping of the knees. So after he passed and Angela was staying in the house, every night, I think it was around midnight if I remember correctly, but every night she would hear, because it was his routine when he was alive, to go check on his wife in her room, make sure she got to bed okay, and then he would walk back to his room. So at every night, Angela would hear the, the popping of the knees down the hall. Of course, he's not alive anymore, but she kept hearing, you know, that disembodied popping of the knees. So interesting story here. Um, okay, disappearance and reappearance of items. So we call this apportation. So you may have coins, whatever it may be, objects that will just randomly appear before you and you're like, wait, what? No, that wasn't here before, right? Feelings of being watched. You may sense an energy in the room with you. Uh, you may see maybe someone, whether it, it could be a deceased loved one or even another energy that you didn't know, you may see them. Random phone calls. This happened to both my mom and I after Helen Pinto passed. And there's other, I have a few other stories. Marie D. Jones, who also lives in San Diego, she's a, a, another author, paranormal researcher. She shares an experience about this as well. But after my grandma died, we kept getting phone calls. This is before cell phones, right? We kept getting phone calls. We answered, there'd be static on the other end. But it was just so weird how it happened right after she died and not before. Repeated messages. You may get these through song, you may see it on a poster, you may see it in a book, you may be out in the grocery store and see a word. Repeated messages, pay attention to those. Uh, messages and music even. So I have an example of Unchained Melody and Endless Love. So Unchained Melody by the Righteous Brothers. So my grandfather, that's uh, Helen Lopinto, me, and then my grandfather, uh, Andrew F. Lopinto, he was a doctor here in San Diego, that uh, obstetrician that uh, served the Italian community. So uh, after he passed, and on the way to his, um, his funeral, the song 
Unchained Melody came up on the radio. And to this day, there are times I'm in the car or maybe I have Pandora playing and it's usually around the time that I'm thinking of him or maybe I'm sharing a story about him with a friend or loved one that that song will come on. So Endless Love, getting back to uh, the story about my cat Max, okay? Cardiomyopathy, one night we were laying on the bed and he was breathing really quickly, jumped off the bed and wailed so loudly and I rushed him to the, the emergency uh, veterinary clinic and they brought him back and the doctor said, look, the, the worst case scenario, this could be, it could be heart failure or it could be a reaction to the beta blockers he was on. All of a sudden, uh, I saw, cause I had a few of the double doors that led back to the treatment room. So all of a sudden I saw the doctor come out and I knew, I knew by the look on his face, what he was going to tell me. I knew he was going to say, I'm so sorry, but this is heart failure. And he came out and that's what he said. And my world collapsed. I just rushed outside and started sobbing. I just, oh, it was so hard. But I find it very interesting that the song Endless Love was playing. And I don't think that that was coincidental at all. And so I've had so many experience with, experiences with Max's spirit. I mean, the day after he passed, I, I, the night, actually the night of, I came home and I heard his meow. I even felt, um, I had my laying in bed and I had my hand on a pillow. My hand was just on a pillow. But all of a sudden, I felt fur underneath it and then like a warmth of it, like pulsating up and down as if you put your hand on your cat's or dog's tummy and you hear them breathing, or you feel them breathing. Now, maybe that was a, like a bereavement hallucination on my part, I don't know, but I've had so many experiences with him. He meows, he jumps up on the bed, I'll hear the little clacky clack of his nails in the kitchen when like no one's in there, it's crazy. So, okay, so we have a few minutes left. I briefly want to talk um, a little bit about um, telepathic dreams are not the same thing as sleep paralysis. We get a lot of emails about sleep paralysis. So, um, sleep paralysis, and I probably should have put this slide, sorry about that, back when I was talking about telepathic dreams, my bad. But anyways, um, Sleep paralysis is a physical phenomenon and it usually happens when a person is waking up or just about to, to fall asleep. And uh, you're not aware that you're dreaming and you can't move your body and sometimes you feel like a sense of falling or uh, floating. You may see figures standing over you or in your room. Um, it's usually, these are usually not paranormal in origin but they're often confused with alien abduction reports, interestingly. Uh, they can accompany other sleep disorders like narcolepsy or daytime sleep uh, caused by certain medications, substance abuse, medical conditions, mental health disorders, you name it. So again, this is out of order. I, I should have, I don't know why I didn't think of that earlier, but just so you know, for though I've experienced sleep paralysis before, it's not the same as a telepathic encounter that you have with an energy when you're asleep. Okay, briefly. I want to talk about this briefly because it's important. Misconceptions of the afterlife. I love entertainment. I love Hollywood, don't get me wrong, but society through entertainment, through media, is giving people a false sense of what the spirit world is. A lot of the shows on TV are catering toward the evil and the demons and the malevolent and what that is doing is that's instilling this idea in people that are already some of these people are already they already have preconceived notions based on their religious or cultural belief to believe that spirits are negative and all that it's influencing people and it's giving a, a false sense of what the afterlife is i've been doing research here for 20 years not here in the library being around for 20 years not one time have I ever been harmed or hurt. And really it's what you put out. If you're gonna go in and be a, excuse me, an a-hole and provoke, you, you may get that back. But if you put out and you're kind and you're respectful and you're reverent to the spirits that you work with, you're going to get that back. So misconception number one, ghosts and spirits cannot harm the living. The shows like to make it, you think that they can, but they cannot harm the living. So let's say someone who really doesn't know about the paranormal or is, is afraid of ghosts moves into a house 
and is afraid of, maybe has started to have experiences and is afraid of what's going on. It's that living person that's assigning that connotation. It's not the other way around where the ghost in there is like, oh, I want to just harm this person here. It's us assigning that, okay? So those and spirits cannot harm the living, okay? They may be curious, they may like to you know, play around and all that, but they're not gonna sit there and try to harm you, okay? Now, you hear of tulpas, which is basically a, a, a thought projection. We all have thoughts, and the more power we give to thoughts sometimes, the more that those thoughts can build and develop their own life forms. And this is a huge influence on, on paranormal research, especially concerning uh, the whole uh, negative and malevolent uh, uh, topic that a lot of these shows have. So a tulpa is a, a Tibetan word meaning emanation or manifestation. You might have heard about this in, I think it's James Hilton's novel, Lost Horizon and the whole fictional earthly paradise of Shangri-La, right? So that's an imagined paradise that came to be because of people's imagination. So in reality, it's an honor to have an experience with the afterlife. It's an honor to have an experience or an encounter if you're investigating, right? So our egos don't necessarily understand it, but our hearts and our wisdom does. So you really want to listen to your heart. You would really want to listen to the inner wisdom as it understands the deeper meaning behind these connections, okay? So with tulpas uh, and, and, and thought formations, you hear, uh, actually, the word paratainment is actually coined by Alan, not me, but you combine paranormal and entertainment, and you have paratainment, right? These shows want uh, reviews, they want ratings, uh, there's benefits to them as well. You get to learn about the locations and the history and all of that. But uh, by showcasing demon, 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 malevolent, 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 it's, it's powering that tulpa. More people are wanting to study demons. Like I said, certain religions and cultures are being influenced. Uh, a lot of times people will want to blame whatever personal issues they're having onto the ghost. Oh, the ghost did it. It's the ghost's fault, right? So these are things that we need to, to pay attention to in the field of paranormal research. So um, fostering the connection, how moving through grief and loss can help you connect with the spirit realm, okay? So you can't really have, uh, talk about grief and loss without Dr. Elizabeth Cooper Ross. Her works have changed the way that society views the end of life. So we have the five stages of grief. We have denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and everyone moves through those differently. There's no real exact order. 